Welcome back everybody to RPG Radio, my name is Winback, and in today's episode we're exploring more lore in the Grim Dawn universe. But before we get started discovering all the hidden treasures along our path northward, we have to make a slight detour. Now I did say we were going to do absolutely everything that's possible with this playthrough and Nemesis bosses are on the high end of my priorities. Full disclosure though, I may have started hitting the big guy before pressing the record button, so you know, my bad. But if you weren't paying attention to Musalaki's health bar either, I guess we're good. Even though we're going to be adding all of the Nemesis bosses to this playthrough, there unfortunately isn't a whole lot of lore to go along with them. In all fairness, everything that I could find only mentions three of them, and Moose is the first. There's also Favius Gonzar and the Reaper of the Lost, but we'll talk about those when we get to them in the playthrough. Basically, Musalaki is a big skeletal gargantuan that is infused with some cold magic, and he's become the proverbial snowball pushed down the snowy hill. That is to say, He's been rolling, picking up more bodies, and getting bigger as time goes on. That's really all I could find in reference to the big guy. But, ultimately, it's better than nothing, I suppose. As for the rest of the Nemesis bosses, though, it's all wild speculation from there on in. So start throwing all your theories around in the comments for me to think about and blab on in all of these videos. With a moose down though, let's turn our attention back to the Black Legion stronghold of Homestead and the encroaching threat of the Chthonian cultists, Ethereal Acolytes, and an anthill so large it's going to require some insanely potent bug spray to deal with. Oliver doesn't want me riding in here anymore. He says it fills my head with dreams when there's work to be done around the farm. So I've been riding at night when he's asleep. He cannot stop the muse that pulls the strings in my heart. The Weeping Oak by Dahlia Thornsbury. The limbs of a nearby tree tapped a steady rhythm against the bedroom window. Another storm was building up on the horizon, but Dahlia could not shake the feeling that this would not be just another shower. She sat up in her bed and took a quick glance at her husband, Oliver. He was still fast asleep. Not even a hurricane would stir that man from his slumber. Dahlia got up, making sure not to shift the covers off her husband. She tiptoed to the wardrobe and retrieved her gear. A well-worn suit of light leather armor and her trusty sword, Stormheart. The blade sparked with electricity as she removed it from its scabbard. The enchantment was still as strong as the day she'd found it in the tomb north of Darkvale. Dahlia replaced the blade and hooked the scabbard into her belt. She took one last glance at Oliver before heading out the door. It was best he did not know about her little nightly vigils. He would just worry himself sick and Dahlia could not stand to see him so obsessed over her safety. The wind whipped Dahlia's hair around her face as she stepped out of the front door. The rain was already starting to pick up. The ground was trenched with moisture, turning the path into mud. Dahlia tread carefully, planting every step on a stone or where the ground was still firm. At last she arrived at the edge of the lone oak tree, a place she could be alone with her thoughts. But there was something off about the spot that night. A deep sense of dread immediately overcame her. I knew you'd come to greet me, Dahlia, my dear. A ghastly voice spoke from behind the tree. Dahlia drew Stormheart, its sparking surface turning the raindrops into mist. 
A dark figure showed itself and calmly walked towards her. She could not see the man's face, but she knew well who he was. Come now, is that any way to greet your brother? The man spoke again. Dahlia did not say a word. Instead, she left her blade to do the talking for her. The figure countered her blows with a blade of his own, a burning sword that left streaks of fire across the air with every swing. I see you've been practicing, the man said with a grin forming on his lips. Thunder crackled in the sky as lightning flared down from the heavens, briefly illuminating the scene. The light from the storm revealed the face of Dahlia's adversary, the grisly, heavily decayed face of her brother, Dravis. Dahlia hissed through clenched teeth. She dove in for another attack. Now there is a lot to unpack when it comes to Dahlia Thornsbury's journal, but we're not going to do that right now because that comes into play much, much later in the game. Suffice it to say, this note is full of lore, but it is also full of secrets that you may want to pay attention to if you're looking to finish out some hidden quests in this game. That being said, though, let's talk about the encampment of rovers and the little girl buried in the crypt. The little girl in the cave, Callista, is the daughter of Elara, and that is the name of the rover whose diary we're going to get pulled up in just a second here. At first glance, these peace-loving rovers just trapped the little girl in an underground tomb and were getting ready to run away and leave her there. When you speak to them upon first entering the camp, there's definitely some uneasy air, but it's only after speaking to Callista that you really get the whole picture. Callista's conversation options determine how the rover camp ends up, but you can use your powers of deduction to find out something fishy before things get real bad. If you try to be the good-natured dope that just wants to help a little girl, regardless of any context, the latter decision will free Balog Nath, the Hellfire, onto the rover camp, killing everyone and leaving you to clean up your demonic mess. You know, or you can just make the right decision and say, hey, what in tarnation? And start going for the full sprint drop kick that that little creeper deserves. If you kill the demon and confront the rovers, though, you get a bit of backstory about the little girl and how she has been seemingly possessed since birth. Her parents couldn't bring themselves to kill her, so instead she was sealed in the tomb in hopes that the torment would end there. And while it's a short story, and it really doesn't have any impact on the overarching uh, world, I, I really think it serves to show the player just how hopeless things can be in this setting. It's another reminder that while we as the player may be nigh invincible, the other denizens of Cairn have increasingly disturbing odds of survival. Had the nightmare again. I'm in an old tomb, barely a candle to light the way. Off in the corner, I see a pair of red glowing eyes. They come closer, closer. Then just before I can make out what it is through the shadows, the creature is gone. I try to run, but every way I go ends up in rubble and stone. There's no escape. I turn around to see the eyes once more staring back at me. I hear laughter, a child's laughter. Then everything is fire. I try to scream, but nothing comes out. The eyes just stare ahead as I writhe in the flames. That is when I awake drenched in sweat. It's been like this for five nights in a row. The nightmares are becoming more frequent, and I'm not so sure how much more of this I can stand. It may not be wise, but perhaps it is time we moved on from this wretched place. We've been sidetracked enough, though, so let's talk about where our character is at and the main flow of the quests in the game as it stands. If you'll remember, we are on a mission from Barnabas and the inhabitants of Devil's Crossing to go out and find some food because we are sorely lacking and it has not been easy pickings when it comes to eating anything other than some nasty soup. When we first arrived in Homestead, though, we talked to two people, and one of them is a very nice farmer guy who is just down on his luck. His name is Douglas, and he is the guy to tell us that while they would love to provide food for everybody, there are a whole bunch of honking large bugs out in the fields making everything impossible to farm. So food supplies are short, everybody's getting cranky, and we need somebody to deal 
with all the bugs. Now these bugs are called the Dermapterids, and this is the only place in the entire world of Cairn that they will exist apart from monster shrines, but they're huge, they're angry, and they've got really, really good monster infrequence. That being said, one that the uh, boss of this genus of enemy will drop for us is... Well, it's really good for this build. I don't, we're definitely not using it anymore because we upgraded the axe a while ago, but up until that time, Ravna's, uh, Ravna's sword was being incredibly, incredibly useful. Now, apart from Douglas in Homestead satisfying all of our food needs, if we can be the exterminator that everyone deserves, we also talk to Captain Sower. Now you can do this after you complete the Dermaptoran quest or you can just get them both out of the way in one go, get those quests lined up and then walk the path. But Captain Somer gives us some intel about an ethereal experiment taking place in an area of farmland known as the Gruesome Harvest. While out there, the ethereals are collecting corpses and perfecting their resurrection techniques. For some time now, according to the captain, the barn has been giving off a blinding light both day and night until very recently. Somer believes that whatever the ethereals are planning is almost done, but we have to stop it because that's the hero that we are before things get out of hand. Truly a tale of two choices, but being that we are the superhuman protagonist that everybody is always underestimating, things could not be easier to finish at the same time. Also, don't forget, little hideaway here full of angry birds who are uh, protecting a chest and some corpses, and if you can believe it, some more cool lore notes for us to read while we're exploring the fields around Homestead. We got away, I couldn't believe it at the time, but we gave those ethereal bastards a slip. They'll never think to look out here in the wilderness. There's nothing here but trees and rocks, certainly nothing for the likes of them. I've gone ahead and set up a camp while a few of the guys ventured out to scavenge for berries and firewood. They should be returning soon. May not be much, but I think we can turn this place into a home away from home. Hell, even the birds must be finding it to their liking. I can see a few of them circling overhead from time to time. And wouldn't you know it, poor Wald is just telling us all about how he and his troop meet their end at the hands of a whole bunch of birdly humans. Ugh. Oh well, remember, the bird people are mutations uh, from the Arcovian curse. So they are basically the next generation of Arcovian child and it turns out they're still very angry about being bird people instead of just being regular people so yeah yeah they're probably gonna pick off some stragglers in the night who have a campfire and look at birds floating around like they're just they're just happy to be alive now in the interest of saving this video from having to shotgun four lore notes all at once and trying to interpret and wrap them all up with each other uh, we're going to move some around because in the playthrough, we're going to find them very close to each other, but we're gonna do them one at a time to give them each the amount of attention that they deserve. Even though some of them are kind of tiny and seem meaningless, I promise you there is enough to it to make it worth your while. But right off the heels of that Aether Scorched Totem, let's take a look at the Aether Scorched Note that we pick up off the corpse along the road to the gruesome harvest. I know you always forget something, so I've written you a list this time. I mean it, don't you show your face back here until everything on this list is marked off. One sack of flour, loaf of bread, two dozen eggs, three bottles of Aralon Red, dress order at the seamstress, and at the bottom of the list, you see a scrawled in addition in messy handwriting, a dozen roses. Now, this note might seem kind of gimmicky. It might seem like a joke. It seems pretty, you know, lame, if we're being honest. It's a wife giving her husband a list of things to do, 
And it doesn't really make a lot of sense until you start to think about where this note came from and the time that it was probably written. Now, seeing as how we find it on the corpse of a man along the road in the fields out here, we can safely assume that he was killed with the note on him and did not ever get his list of items or his dozen roses. Meaning that his wife back home is also probably sharing the same fate as he. Now, why that is, is a bit ambiguous. Obviously, we don't have any answers, but it could be because of the gigantic Dermapterin infestation going on in the farmlands, or what I feel is more likely is probably closer to the Grim Dawn happening at a moment's notice, wiping out huge amounts of people in the middle of their everyday lives. So, with that context, this lore note is a lot more tragic because you see a husband and a wife living their daily lives in the middle of an argument, one of them trying to sweeten things up a bit, make sure that the romance is alive, and then everything just gets silenced. The two of them are gone, and they'll never ever get to see the happy ending that really looked like it was in store for them at the end of that shopping list. So suddenly, this innocuous little shopping list of a note becomes that much more impactful with the context and the tragedy surrounding everything that happened right after this note was written. I can see smoke rising from the Everbrook estate. They're nearly here, whatever they are. I've barricaded the doors and windows as best I could. All that remains now is to wait for them to come to us. The wife insisted that we abandon the farm and head for Homestead, but I'll be damned if I let some green-eyed freaks kick us off our land. Our family has not toiled on this farm for generations just to leave it at the first sign of trouble. Those cowards in Homestead can leave their crops to rot. When all this blows over, I'll still be here tending to the harvest, and they'll all look like fools. And then, in very stark contrast to the last note, we get an overt display of machismo from the farmer who does not want to leave his land. And it just reeks of, man, this guy's dumb. But we are the only people who know that because we're the player. We know all the events of everything going on, and we're in the future. The uh, farmer is obviously super dead because he tried to fight off a huge army of uh, green-eyed freaks, I believe the words were, while sequestering his wife to the farmhouse in some weird attempt to show the other farmers how much farming he can do? I don't know, man. Seems weird. I mean, if I gotta lock myself in my house at the end of, you know, the world, because that's the only option, sure, whatever. I guess I'll stick with it. But if there is a fort full of other people and, you know, the military, I'm probably gonna head over there. Uh, if the farm is still uh, kicking around afterwards, I'll get back to it, you know? life goes on, but, um, I mean, if you get eaten by zombies, it's just, it's, that's it. You don't get any do-overs, brother. Uh, yeah. But again, another, another note geared directly towards the middle of the Grim Dawn. As it is immediately happening, we get the point of view of this, um, farmer and his wife getting ready to ride things out just like you would at the beginning of a storm that you are completely underestimating and just like that we really know how they ended up because you don't survive something like that now i do want to mention in the den of the lost down here there is some cheeky pop culture reference from the developers so there is an enemy that you fight who has a monster and frequent which is a ring but his name is Gallus. He is a uh, cave-dwelling 
uh, I can't remember what the type of enemy is, but he's a humanoid, he's got a, uh, a staffer, and he goes invisible. <laughs> Get it? Because the ring, Lord of the Rings, Gollus, Gollum, Stad. I'm sure it was very easy to figure out once you got to that point and you could see it, but that is one of a couple different um, Lord of the Rings references in this game, and that is the easiest to understand. There is another... Oh, there's another enemy that is a spider, I believe, and... You know what? We actually... We already passed her because she's in she's in a very similar uh, setting. I think she is in not the mountain deeps. No, she's in the mountain deeps. He's in the den of the lost. Pretty sure how that's that's how it works. But anyway, um, it the the other enemy's name is Ungoliant, and she has a a monster infrequent that is a necklace. But she's a spider, and if you're at all familiar with the Silmarillion and uh, Tolkien lore, you know that. Oh. I'm trying to remember the, uh, the name of the spider itself, but she's a spider so big that she eats everything. She's just massive. And as the story goes, or, you know, the lore goes, as, as I know it, uh, she ends up eating herself because she got so hungry and didn't have anything to eat. So she started chowing down, and that's where she went. So, pretty cool. Uh, there are probably more references, but at the time of this recording, I can only remember those two. So, keep that in your cap for a stormy day when somebody asks for some... Grim Dawn Lord that they didn't know, right? You know what I'm saying? There's the Aether Scorch. Note along the path, you could see it in the middle of all that Aether fire, so it's very safe to assume it. That's where our boy died. That poor rose-picking man just couldn't make it. And there's Walter's Note, the grumpy old farmer who uh, wanted to stick it out at the apocalypse and obviously didn't stand a chance. Bummer. But Walter's Note also mentions the smoking Everbrook estate, and that's where we're headed right now. Here be written the last will and decree of the late Marthos Anthony Everbrook II. To my daughter, dearest Lizzie, I leave the farmstead and its surrounding orchards. Let the land which has blessed our family with harvest for generations continue to provide for you and your children. And now to my bullheaded sons, Adric and Anthony. You have filled my remaining years with your endless bickering over whom would inherit my fortune. To you I leave nothing but these words. I had the farm hands bury the gold somewhere on the Everbrook lands. You now have but two options. Move on with your miserable lives and start anew through backbreaking labor, just as your great grandfather did before you, or squander your youth searching for that which you do not deserve. I trust you will make the right decision. Along the bottom, you can barely make out some scribbled notes in a different handwriting. In the hills up the road from the Thornsberries, bring explosives. Can you imagine pissing your dad off so much arguing with your brother that he's just like, uh, I'm gonna go bury the gold. I'm not gonna give it to anybody. I'm just gonna stick it in a hole that you'll never find. Good luck and peace out. And then he dies. So, yeah, uh, a grudge, serious grudge material from father to his two very ungrateful sons and one super happy daughter, I'm sure, that got the farm and just said, uh, you guys suck, I'm gonna do what dad wanted, peace out, who knows. But more importantly, we've made it to the gruesome harvest and we're coming up on the barn that glows brightly both day and night. Hiding inside is the ethereal amalgamation. Without a doubt, one of the coolest looking enemies in the entire game, and the boss fight, while incredibly short, unfortunately because of all of the damage that our character can do in this playthrough, 
is still very cool. So this model is awesome, and I am very glad that it makes an appearance later on as a smaller enemy. Consensus is achieved. The sanctum of Homestead is to fall within the fortnight. With the Herald making its steady approach from the north, nothing but conflagration in its wake, it falls upon me to render a force capable of assaulting the human stronghold from the west. The reanimators are tirelessly working within the cages, pouring the gift of the Aether into the humans and trolls we had gathered for the purpose. But the real work will be conducted within the barn. It is true that the humans have proven to be difficult hosts. The mind struggles against a greater power it cannot possibly fathom, but the flesh it is malleable, easily tainted. I look upon the corpses filling the barn with the stench of decay not as a sign of how fragile life is, but as a canvas, a canvas upon which we will paint the future of Cairn. Theoden Marcel, Shaper of Flesh. Now, the episode is coming to a steady close, but there are a few things in that last lore note that do bode well for the rest of the playthrough. So, if you will notice, the letter was written by Theoden Marcel, the Shaper of Flesh, and that is the big bad for Ashes of Malmoth. We'll meet him eventually, but he mentioned the Herald who is coming down from the north and who we will actually meet in the next episode because we'll be breaking into Port Valbury, the key dungeon for the Ethereals and potentially meeting another nemesis boss just in time to not know anything about them. Now the Herald of the Stars is not that nemesis but it is in its own right a very very cool enemy and will happen upon that as it is but at the end of this episode we still have the choice to either join the order of death's vigil or the cult really um of kaiman kaiman's chosen don't forget when you get the uh decision made and you go up to sorrow's bastion to meet with the leader of whichever faction you've chosen to align yourself with you will have access to their faction vendor right here in homestead next to douglas so there will be another vendor who can sell you stuff from either kaiman's chosen or the order of death's vigil right there in homestead so you don't always have to go to sorrow's bastion to do that anyway now that that's out of the way we have fed well we've cleared the fields so that the farmers can feed everyone in devil's crossing talking to douglas getting all that, that out of the way, and Captain Somer is setting us on a mission to go kill some Chthonians off to the north as well. That being said, we'll kick off the next episode of the Ultimate Lore Through as best we can, fighting our way through Port Valbury. We'll get the key dungeon out of the way, and then start moving north toward Darkvale to see what the Cult of Chthon has in store for the worlds of Cairn. But that's it for this episode, everybody. Let me know what you think if this lore video is keeping up with the pace of the other ones. If there is anything that I am missing, feel free to let me know because I'm still trying to hit literally everything that I can, but sometimes stuff gets real small and it escapes my ever-wandering eye. So, until next time, I'll see you there. Peace out. <laughs>